Turning your Bibles to Joshua chapter 7 as we continue in this series through what is indeed a really an amazing book as it highlights for us very much our own spiritual journey in life as we wage war against the world, the flesh, and the devil. It gives to us very valuable principles that if we would heed them and lean upon them, we would be better for it. It wasn't just given to us as a Sunday school story that we might use as children, but it's given to the church of all ages that we might learn what the Spirit has to say to us. Joshua chapter 7, I'm going, to be re- I'm going to begin reading in verse 10, reading through the end of the chapter. This is the word of the Lord. Let's give attention to it in your hearing this afternoon. Joshua 7, beginning with verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for for, tomorrow. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans, and the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zarahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zarahites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household, man by man, and Achan the son of Carmi, son of Zebdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel and they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters, his oxen, donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Amen. This is indeed the word of the living God. One sage wrote the following. The greater the man, the dearer the price he pays for a short season of sin. The greater the man, the dearer the price he pays for a short season of sin or sinful pleasure. That quote may not strike you as odd when you find out that it's referred to, as used to refer to the sin of King David. David undoubtedly was a great man. He was the greatest king in in all of Israel. 
He was a man even after God's own heart, but we know that David suffered dearly for a short season of sin. Now, whether Achan here in our text was a great man is really, frankly, irrelevant. He paid a great and dear price for his sin, as did the people of God. As we saw two weeks ago, secret sin can have, indeed, terrible consequence for God's people, as much as public sin. Secret sin, public sin, can have terrible consequences for God's people. Last week, two weeks ago, you were challenged. This is one of those moments in a sermon in which I don't even know if I want to ask this question, but I'll ask it nonetheless. You were challenged and exhorted to examine your life to see if there is any wicked way in you. Did you find any? The problem with sin in the camp is that it is like the leaven that leavens the whole lump. It must be dealt with. If the church is to function as she ought, without church discipline, which is indeed a mark of the church, the true church, there can be no real peace in the church. The absence of conflict does not guarantee the presence of peace. I got that from a movie, by the way. The absence of conflict does not necessitate or guarantee the presence of peace. Now here in the context, as we have already noted and read uh, in the the reading of the text, uh, we have a, 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 a difficult circumstance, a horrible circumstance in the life of Israel. The church of old has sinned. As we noted two weeks ago, this sin was relegated to the people and they suffered the consequences of it, even though it was really done under the cover of darkness by one man and his family, Achan. But unbeknownst to Joshua and the people, uh, this had occurred, and as a result, then, therefore, they suffered terribly as a result. And here, now, we have, in these verses, verses 10 through 26, we have given to us the way to resolve it, the way to deal with it, the way to exercise the proper means and methods that we might expunge from within the church that little leaven, or in this case, the big leaven, or maybe put a different way, the silver and the gold that is ruining the very nature of the church and hurting the reputation of the church, but worse than all of that, it is bringing the ire and angst of a holy God down upon them. It's given to us in very orderly fashion, with great detail, and we're not going to deal with every single detail, but we are going to glean from it the functional principles of the serious nature of this issue and the way to maintain the purity and peace of the church as it's given to us in this chapter. And so I'm going to show you this afternoon the serious nature of sin and how it is to be handled in the church if she is to maintain her purity and peace. i got to tell you, it's not a popular subject in the world we live. There are so-called churches today that don't do anything when it comes to sin in the church. They don't discipline the members. They don't uh, bother. They think it's none of their business, and they have never read Joshua 7, let alone Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, Galatians 6, and a host of other passages. Frankly, it's because they don't really take seriously the nature of sin and its influence. And so I'm going to show you the serious nature of sin and how it is to be handled in the church if if she is to maintain her purity and peace. Three points as we consider these verses together this afternoon. First, we'll consider the charges, then the investigation, and then the consequences. The charges, the investigation, and then the consequences as detailed for us in this narrative event that occurs in the life of Israel, verses 10 through 26 of Joshua chapter 7. The charges. We noted already uh, from this previous sermon that the the charges are given to us, although Joshua knows nothing about the event. 
You note in verse 6 that he's a man of great sorrow. He doesn't understand. He doesn't even know what's going on. It's all been done under the cover of darkness, unbeknownst to him, unbeknownst to the people. He has no knowledge of it. The people have no knowledge of it. And so he responds in the only way that he could respond. God's abandoned us. God has rejected us. He has gone against his promises. He begins to have doubt. He begins to wonder and linger, and he has great sorrow. Verse 6, Joshua tore his clothes, fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads, and Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? It's amazing how quickly he moves to this conclusion. Now, you could hardly blame him. He doesn't know. All he knows, that not uh, too many days before, and he's still hearing the re- repeated refrain of God in his ears, who said to him, I will be with you. The land is yours. Take it. I will be with you. I won't abandon you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. It looks like you have. And so he's a man of great sorrow. This very posture of the man He's a man of distress and, indeed, doubt. Has God really said that he would care for us? Has God really said, why did you bring us out of, why did you do this? Just so you could destroy us? But then the accusation comes, doesn't it? Now, in some sense, this is a little bit of a review to catch you up as to where we were. It's been two weeks. The accusation of Yahweh. One commentator sets it out this way and really in this order that they had transgressed God's covenant which he commanded them they took the devoted things they stole they deceived and then they placed those stolen goods among their things I mean this is a conspiracy this isn't just a one-off oopsie I stubbed my toe I took the Lord's name in vain I'm sorry about that that was terrible and it is no no this is a conspiracy a contrived effort this is a plan to sin against the God of heaven. No, first, they transgressed God's covenant, which he commanded them. Remember what he told them. When you go to take Jericho, what are they to do? They are to destroy everything. They are to get rid of it. It's all devoted to God. It should be devoted to destruction. It's done. Don't keep a thing. Not a, nothing. But someone did. Unbeknownst to Joshua at this point, someone has done exactly what they were told not to do. They took from the devoted things. They, in effect, in a sense, stole it. And who did they steal it from? From the God of heaven himself. They deceived. How did they deceive? By dropping the items in their tent and then burying them in their tent. Among their own things, as though we can hide our sin, we can sweep it under the rug, we can kind of mingle it in with all the good things that we do, and somehow it'll get lost in the equation. It it doesn't work that way, by the way. Have you ever been asked by somebody, would you be willing to drink a glass of pure water if I put a drop of cyanide in it? I mean, there's a lot of pure water surrounding the cyanide. What's the problem? Uh, The problem is you're dead if you drink it. Here's the problem. They seek to mingle these items amongst all the good things that they may have done. Achan and his family probably participated in the taking of Jericho. At least Achan probably did. Undoubtedly he did. Notice in this transgression the various commandments that they break. Achan himself says in the narrative that he coveted He coveted the things. He wasn't content with what God had given to them. He wasn't content with the blessing of God. He coveted what he did not possess, and that led to the temptation, which led to the sin. There's a sermon in there, I think, probably for another day. They stole another violation of the commandments. Clearly, Thou shalt not steal. And he did. They lied. That is to say, they deceived the people. Achan doesn't come to Joshua here when he sees the people in distress. He doesn't come to Joshua on his own accord. He doesn't come to him and say, Hey, look, you know what, Joshua? I know what happened. It's my fault. I've sinned against God. 
I wonder sometimes, and again, this is probably a little bit of a speculation, but I wonder if he had done that had he been spared. But he persisted in his sin until he was found out. And then he repents. Oftentimes, we're the same way when it comes to our own sin. We don't actually own it until we're found out. And then we're owning it only because we got found out. Not because we actually recognize that we have grieved the holy God. In other words, we're more upset about the consequence of the sin than we are the sin itself. When's the last time you've been pulled over by a police officer for speeding? Yeah, you're sorry, all right. Why? Because you got caught. Not because you were speeding. Aiken isn't concerned with coming up with it on his own. He's got to wait it out. He waits it out, and he gets discovered in this very interesting process, which we'll get to in just a minute. So Jehovah says to him, get up, Joshua. Israel has sinned. It's a corporate sin, but through one man's sin, sin enters the world. Through one man's sin, sin enters the camp. In some sense, you have almost in a weird kind of warped way, maybe not so warped, And I'm just thinking about this standing right here, so that's the beauty of preaching extemporaneously. But what does this remind you of? Sin occurs by one person. Sin comes into the camp. It affects the whole camp. The whole corporate nation of Israel is suffering as a result. Who does that remind you of? Maybe Adam. Through one man's sin, sin enters the world. Therefore, all have sinned. Through one man's sin, Achan, it enters the camp. Therefore, they all suffer for it. And you can't say that we aren't suffering under the misery of sin in this world because of it. God applies this to the corporate nature of it, even though here we have Achan as a guilty party. Notice in verses 11 and 12 how God continues to uh, refer to them in the plural. Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people, plural, of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted to destruction. I mean, this is all corporate. You might think this isn't very fair. Well, you might think that. You're free to think that, I guess. But we're not talking about human judgment and justice here. We're talking about the justice of a holy God. And sometimes, because of sin in the church, one sin by one person, sin that's not dealt with, sin that's not repented from, sin that occurs, the entirety of the body can suffer. Many of you have had splinters really deep embedded in your finger, your hand. You, know, you can't get it out no matter what. You've you got to wait it out. Wait for your body to naturally get rid of it, eject it. But, man, it's painful. And sometimes it's painful not just in the hand in which the sliver exists. Sometimes it's painful elsewhere. You ever stub your toe? I think I used that last time. Man, your whole body hurts. Why? It's just a toe. Because they're all connected interconnected. God places this charge in the accusation against Joshua. The bottom line is that the central sin was the sin of unbelief. As much as it was the sin of stealing and deceiving and coveting and all of these other things, at the end of the day, the real sin here that is going on in the camp is the sin of unbelief. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. God told them to devote it all to destruction. They should have trusted God. He knew what he was doing. Not the wisdom of man. Oh, we might need that. We might need this. You know, God doesn't know what he's talking about. Adam didn't believe God. God told them, don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If they eat it, you'll die. Adam's like, ah. I don't think so. As a result of his unbelief in the commandment of God and the promise extended there in the tree of life, all of us have landed into ruin. 
The very things that God had told them was devoted to destruction was that which God now says they will, they will be devoted to destruction. You see the play on words here? Notice how he says that there in verse, um, verse 12. He tells them to devote all things to destruction. Take Jericho, it's yours. But they don't. When God's going to get his justice, and he says, okay, fine, you know what? You don't want to devote those things to destruction, then you're devoted to destruction. This is pretty serious. He's going to wipe them out. Reminds me of the events that occurred in Genesis chapter, or I say that every time, Exodus 32. Maybe one day I'll remember it's in Exodus. You know the event, I know the event at least, the golden calf. There they are, worshiping the golden calf, calling it the God of heaven who brought them out of Egypt. I mean, nothing could be more heinous. What does God tell Moses? Your people. Moses up there on the mountain, he's talking to God, and he says to Moses, it's a really interesting verse in the narrative, your people, not my people, your people have profaned themselves. Go down off this mountain because I'm going to destroy them. God takes it seriously. Sin is not a trifle matter with him. It doesn't matter how little a sin you might think it is or how big a sin it might have been. Each one of those sins, regardless of what it was, whether it was small or great in your mind, required the crucifixion of the Lord of glory. He takes it seriously. And so here he gives this indictment against the people of Israel. The charges are set the judgment is handed out. The bottom line is that the sin in the camp, now known, must be handled. Imagine if Joshua had simply said to him, that is not the, that serious. I mean, what's the big deal, God? Really, who cares? What do you need it for? You don't need anything. What if he had said and argued and debated with the God of heaven? What if he said it's not that important? Maybe Joshua should have debated with God and argued that it's a small sin. There are people in the world today that do just that. It's just a small sin. What's the problem? What's the big deal? Everybody does it. I'm only human. Which, by the way, is not the best way to express sin. You know, Adam and Eve were human before they sinned. No, sin is serious. It's not to be trifled with. God is not going to trifle with it. It must be dealt with. And if it doesn't get dealt with, God's going to deal with it. And he, de and he would deal with it in a cataclysmic way. Some sins, according to our shorter catechism, however, some sins are, by reason of their several aggravations, that is to say consequences, are more heinous in the sight of God than others. That is to say that some sins in the church do, because of the consequences that they bring, are, as it were, more heinous in God's sight than other sins. For instance, I'm walking across the hallway of the church on a Tuesday afternoon. Nobody's here but me, and I jam my foot into the wall for whatever reason, because I'm probably moving too quickly, and out comes a word from the blackness of my own heart that I would hope nobody would have heard me say but me. But God heard it. And so I repent of that, and I, I confess it to the Lord, and I move on. Probably not going to bring much damage to the church. Change the sin. My wife's away in Florida, and I decide, you know what? Time to play. Run off, do something stupid. What kind of consequence do you think that brings to the body of Christ? Significant. Huge consequence. And so while it is true that some sins are indeed more aggravating because of the consequences, more heinous in the sight of God than others, we must never forget that all sin, no matter what it is, requires the death of the Savior. No matter how small or how great. So God gives to Joshua the rules of the investigation. It's interesting, as you read through this rather odd way of discovering the, the culprit, the guilty party, God doesn't just call them out of the tent and say, Achan, get out here, come to the principal's office, you in big trouble. No. God doesn't tell Joshua either up front who the, sin, who the guilty party is. He doesn't do that either. What we have here 
really in principle is an investigation. Now that Joshua, the leader of Israel, knows about the matter, an investigation is about to take place. Who is it? Who's done it? There's a process established by Jehovah. It was orderly. Not like the chaos we see in investigations in today's world and in some churches. We are to do, as all Presbyterians know all too well, their favorite verse is to do all things decently and in order. Their sin in the church is to be handled according to the manner in which the Lord lays it down and no other. We don't go off and do what we want in our worldly wisdom of affairs and events. We do as God has told us to do it. He is the all-wise one, and we simply submit to that. We may think we know better, but we don't. And so God gives to Joshua this process in verses 16 through 18. Not telling Joshua who sinned. He knows. Of course he knows. But he does tell him to investigate it. Sometimes in the church that's necessary. It has to happen. Sometimes things happen that need to be dealt with. But it's to be done in an orderly way. And so what are the results? The results are obvious, aren't they? I mean, how smart do you have to be? The guilty party's discovered. Go through this entire process. You read about it in verses 16 through 21. You, you read about the process, and, and this person is taken, and that person is whittling it down until we get to this guy, Achan. And then, of course, then he says, okay, I've sinned. It's as though he's standing there watching this entire investigation take place. And unless he didn't have a conscience whatsoever, he knows darn well where this is headed. He absolutely knows where it's going. And he knows he's going to be found out. And instead of coming forward in the beginning of the process, he waits until the very end of it and then says, okay, I'm busted. I did it. I sinned. Uh, Yeah, we got that part. And he lays out all of the reasons for why he did what he did. The guilty party is discovered. What do we learn from this is that we can be sure that unless we deal with our own sin, according to the means that God has given to us, you can be sure your sins will be discovered. God will not be mocked. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, Achan, you will be found out. Whatever you sow, you will reap. You put into the ground garbage, you're going to get garbage. Achan sowed transgression and sin into his family. And through this very clear process, he is discovered. Notice how he puts it. Verse 21, when I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, 200 shekels of silver, a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them, and see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. It's kind of humorous, actually, because later when they take Achan's family and they take the possessions, the things that he stole, did you notice that they took his tent too? The very vehicle by which he used to hide his sin? They took that too. I thought that was humorous. Okay, so nothing's left. So the consequences of this egregious action is that, well, Achan confesses it. What else could he do? He's discovered. Ah, He could sit there and lie, I guess. He could sit there and pretend like he didn't do it. Maybe he blames somebody else, like Adam did. It was my wife, you know, the wife you gave me. That wouldn't have gone over very big. Didn't go over big then, didn't go, wouldn't have gone over big now. But no, he says, he admits it, but what else could he really do? He confesses his sin before Joshua, and the result is obvious, isn't it? Death comes. As that type of Adam here, bringing death very much into the world, the wages of sin are death, he is killed for his sin, 
And you may think, well, that's a little harsh. This is what you deserve. I deserve. My sin requires death. My little sin, my big sin, my everything in between sin, it all requires death. The second, we note, not only did it require death, we note that it was serious. God did not trifle with it. And look around the world and see what sin and its effects has done in the world. The things that it has accomplished and the ruin it has brought to marriages, to various relationships, to finances, to our government, to leaders, to our bodies, everything. This serious nature of issue. One that we cannot just simply ignore. But then there's also, thankfully, a sacrifice. Achan here is the sacrifice. He's going to sacrifice himself, as it were, due to the consequence of his sin for the sake of the people. Had Joshua and the people not done this, the leaven would still be in the camp. And the judgment of God would not fall just on Achan, but it would have fallen on the entirety of the people. In much the same way, that is what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. You're guilty. I'm guilty. I got nothing to stand on. I got nothing to offer. I cannot even come up with any simple reason to explain why God should accept me just because of who I am. I'm guilty. I deserve to die. But he who was not guilty, or put a different way, a biblical way, he who knew no sin became sin for me, that I might find the righteousness of God in Christ, that I might find peace with him, that I might not suffer what Achan suffers, the judgment of a holy, righteous God. So what we have here is very much an act of the church disciplining her own, dealing with the sin that is eroding the very fabric of the community. So much so that 30-some-odd people lost their life, so much so that Joshua was in mourning, so much so that God took seriously the matter and had to instigate an investigation to find it out. What we have is church discipline. It's here in its very early forms, matters related to the church and how to deal with sin. There are three marks of the church today. Calvin says there's two, but I think he lumps the third under the ministry of the word. Calvin says there's two, the preaching of the word and the right administration of the Lord's Supper. But most reformers today believe that in order to be a church, You must have these three marks. First, you must have the sound preaching of the Word of God. This was done in this passage when God Himself told the people what they can and cannot do. Joshua chapter 6, He tells them exactly how to do things. He gives them a sermon that He expects them to obey, but they don't listen, or at least one of them didn't. And because they didn't listen, it led to sin. Second, There's the right administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper in particular has a unique way of fleshing out secret sin in the lives of God's people and helping them keep short short account of sin. How many times have you heard me say that from the table? Deal with your sin right now. This is the opportunity. God's been gracious to you, and this is the chance to look inside your heart, ask the Lord to forgive you, deal with it. Don't hide it. Don't bury it. Don't pretend like it doesn't matter. Nobody knows. No, deal with it. God's gracious, he'll forgive you. Third, there is the faithful exercise of church discipline. Discipline itself can be both negative and positive. It is not something we need to oppose or even fear or resist. Each Lord's Day, whether you know it or not, you are receiving discipline. You might think, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? That's because we've been conditioned to believe that discipline is always negative. 
But it's not always negative. It's a form of making disciples. That's the root word of discipline. Here we have in the preaching of the Word of God, especially a positive aspect by which God's people are being disciplined to live the Christian life, to walk according to the Christian life and all the mandates of God's Word and to look to Christ and lean upon Him alone for salvation and to stay on the narrow path and to deny themselves and seek first God's kingdom. Now that's disciple-making. That's discipline. It's not as egregious as the kind of discipline Achan experienced, is it? I mean, no one's bombing you with stones in here, I don't think, maybe verbally a little. Um, And there's no fire, well, maybe, well. But then there's the negative discipline, the one that we tend to go to when we hear the word discipline. I'm being disciplined. Mom and dad disciplined me last night. Mom and dad are disciplining you every day, whether you know it or not, whether it's positive or negative, but that's the one we usually think about Sometimes offenses in the church rise to the level of church discipline. That is to say, to deal with the very sin that is in the camp. To refuse to do that leaves the people of God without God. Did you hear that? When a church refuses to deal with the sin in their own camp, a sin that's not being dealt with, a sin that has not been repented, a sin that is being swept under the rug and hidden... They are a church without God. That is simply to say they are not a church. They're a gathering of people doing whatever it is they do, but God is not there. Faithful discipline is not fireman theology. Faithful elders and pastors stay connected to the people of God. Why? Because we understand the propensity to hide sin. The elders can visit you in your home, they can ask all the right questions, and you can lie. That's true for a while. It's not fireman theology. We don't come rushing in when the thing is out of control. We stay connected to the people of God. And when they notice various cracks in the lives of the people they are called to care for, they should probe, ask in a word, they should shepherd them. Not always easy. Look, I've done enough shepherding visits in this church to know it's not always easy to ask hard questions. Why do I ask? Because I'd rather deal with it here than to have to deal with it in the more formal sense of the word discipline in the church. When that occurs, it's even more ugly and more awful for the person who won't repent. So in the camp is a terrible thing. It's never fun to handle. I'm pretty sure Joshua did not enjoy this process all that much. I can't imagine he stood there on the sidelines as the people of Israel bombed Achan and his family and all of his possessions with stones and fire, and I'm, I don't think he was cheerleading. This is not a fun time for the people. But it's a necessary one. And if not handled correctly and carefully and wisely, it will lead to ruin. It will lead to the ruin of the church. Look, I can tell you candidly, as one who has been a part of the process on this side of it, as an elder in the church, it is never fun. I've told my elders that I, I lose sleep during this process. Because I grieve for their soul pleading with God to change them, because only He can, hoping that they would come to their senses and repent of the sin and turn away from it, to not resist and not dig in and, 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 and refuse to hear. It's not easy, but it must be done. A church that refuses to discipline cannot call themselves rightly a church, and a church that refuses to discipline will indeed, as a church, incur the wrath of God. This is why the Apostle Paul was so painfully painfully clear in 1 Corinthians 5 when he exhorted the elders of that church to get that man out of their midst. I was being kind. He called him an evil man. And it must be done. The way to short-circuit church discipline, as far as the members are concerned, is to simply recognize your sin, don't hide it, repent of it, and turn away. 
the whole process stops right there. Because as you probably know, nobody is ever disciplined in the church for the sin they commit. But they are disciplined because they won't repent of it. They won't turn away from it. They hold on to it. And that is not a mark of a Christian. And if that is what's occurring within the life of the congregation, it will bring ruin to the people. And so we see here in this chapter secret sin that leads to grief and mourning in the leadership, an awareness of the situation given by a holy God who will not trifle with sin, giving instructions as to how to deal with it properly and orderly, and then we see the resolution. God does deal with it. And as a result, then we see chapter 8, which we haven't come to yet. We see really the other side. We see the blessing of God given back to the people of God. But only until, only when, they eradicate the sin that is in their midst. Amen. Our Father, these are hard words, and they are often difficult to do. It would be so much easier to just ignore it. Let it go. Why cause strife and trouble in the church? That's not how you have ordered it. And so, Lord, we pray that we would not hide our sin. We would always be quick to repent of sin. We pray that as we find in those people an unwillingness to do so, that we would have the grace of your Spirit to do what is right, carefully, gently, with wisdom, according to your word. And so help us in all of these things. But we need the wisdom from on high to rightly handle your people. We pray and ask for Christ's sake. Amen.